we'll swiftly move on to the next one. Uh, I'll uh, introduce you to Ma Martin Gregory, who is head of risk for uh, risk assurance. Uh, sorry for uh, the Reed Group. And uh, say so any questions. Obviously, if we can leave those to the end, uh, and then we'll hopefully have some time for a, a brief Q and A session afterwards. I'll leave you in, uh, in good hands. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Apologies for the slight delay, not that it was my problem, or fault for that matter. Um, I'd basically like to take you through a series of slides that looks at how best to calculate and defend cost contingency. Um, I'm head of risk for Reed Group. My background's in the MOD. Spent 10 years as a, an MOD project manager and then left the MOD to join a, a consultancy called HBR in the risk team. And during that time, we spent a lot of uh, time with MOD project teams, helping them to get through their major investment decision points, often through helping them to write business cases uh, and articulating risk information well, such that money could be released so that the project could proceed. Um, I now work for Reed Group. Um, we've got a stand in the hall. Do come and speak to us. Um, Reed Group is a professional services organization with 500 people strong. Um, we manage, on behalf of our clients, a portfolio of £4 billion worth of projects. Um, but we also offer sort of individual sort of services like risk management, EVM services and the like. So this is the content of the presentation. Um, context is, as described, calculating and justifying cost contingency during bid development. I'll try to give it a bit of context so it can sort of appreciate what I'm getting at and why it's important to, to do it well. I've got a few slides on why, to bother, why do we need to bother doing cost risk analysis. I've got a few slides on what looks good and what looks bad in terms of cost risk modeling practice. Um, then I've got a, a proposed approach that people should adopt and a number of slides around how to improve the quality of inputs going into your cost risk model. So why bother? Now these are the typical questions that are raised at a bid review point. Can we win the work? Can we deliver it? And will we make a profit? Now, unfortunately, enthusiastic bid team, they will always answer yes. Often we have little time to write bids, and uh, invariably people just want to get it out of the door. And unfortunately, little time is often spent looking at how the project may threaten your organization and how the project could have a significant financial impact So really the context and sort of focus of the cost risk modeling um, for this presentation is around the will we make a profit. So how can we understand the potential cost of a project better so that we understand our likelihood of achieving our target margin on a piece of work? So rather than that question, will we make a profit, maybe a more appropriate question is something like, what percentage confidence do you have achieving target margin? I apologize, I keep having to uh, go to the laptop because this isn't working. Show me how you came to that figure. A few observations because I've been working with a number of companies that are struggling to get uh, bidding right and getting their pricing right when writing bids. Um, the bidding stage is often the time we are most uncertain about how the project is going to proceed yet we often spend little time understanding the risk and the uncertainty surrounding the estimates that we put forward in that, that cost build-up. Often a single pass, often right towards the end of the bid development stage. And quite commonly, and it depends on who your client base is to some degree, um, Contingency is often removed, and it's often removed during bid review meetings. The seniors uh, within an organization may choose to consider the risk budget 
as being the most appropriate means of bringing the price down because it's not well defined. Your risk register is weak, your risk descriptions are weak. So there's a few things in this presentation that will help you improve the articulation of risk when building that price up. Customer intervention as well as a common form of contingency reduction as well that does commonly occur. Um, if working in the MOD, for example, you may have be putting a single source price together. The MOD will then investigate that price in detail. And if you can't justify why a certain risk in your risk register has a certain impact, then it's very easy to take it away uh, and bring the price down. I've seen instances where risks that are owned by the MOD are included in risks, uh, risk registers that go forward as in, a, in a bid to the MOD, well, it's obviously going to get taken out. So a few pointers there in terms of uh, a key to defending your contingency allocation within a, within a price. Um, there are many factors, but here are a few that are quite valuable. High quality risk descriptions by their very nature will result in better quality risk estimates. Commonly, um, we don't devote a huge amount of time to getting our risk descriptions well. But if we are to estimate the impact of a risk better, we need to be able to understand what the risk is and what the, how the potential sources of uncertainty surrounding that risk could combine to influence the overarching impact. A well thought out and logical cost risk model, and I'll explain to some degree how we can do that. And a clear understanding of risk ownership. We're all really good at estimating cost, aren't we? But there are many historical examples of where projects have an estimate carried out at the onset, and it results, um, well, that speaks for itself, from 28 million to 100. 50 million. There are all reasons behind that, but someone was asked to put an estimate together um, for the cost of putting a bridge across the Humber, and many examples. Jubilee, Jubilee Line as well. Being complacent. This is uh, a commonly seen attitude in amongst organisations. Risk budget. We just add 10% to the base cost. And management reserve, oh, that's just another 5%. Well, that's that particular company lost a lot of money on a single project. And if you consider the price of the project as it was submitted, that is a very large percentage loss. So the primary output of a, a cost risk model is... Um, what, we, what we see up on the screen there, which along the bottom we've got cost at completion and up the y-axis we've got uh, cumulative probability or, or confidence. And you can use the output of that cost risk model to determine your risk budget or the known unknowns. Your planned cost will have a will have a, a percentage confidence associated with it. So in that instance, you are 10% confident that you will achieve your planned cost. And the risk budget in that instance, which is a commonly used figure at 80% confidence, the risk budget will be allocated based on what that cost is there. So in effect, the difference between there and there is the, the risk budget. And obviously you can see, actually an important point here actually is that you can't use cost risk modelling for the purpose of defining management reserve. Management reserve is traditionally um, added to uh, the plan cost and risk budget based on a number of environmental factors such as uh, the risk appetite for that particular organisation or the fact that um, it has bid recently on a whole series of projects and has put in a healthy management reserve 
Uh, and in this instance, they, they're more keen to win the work, so they might bring and reduce that management reserve. So what does it take to get cost, model, cost risk modeling right? And very crudely, um, and I will go into more detail, of good practice. You've got to know what a bad cost risk model looks like, and there are many examples Many examples that are commonly carried out that are not good ways of carrying out cost risk analysis, and I'll show you a few. But I know what good looks like as well. Um, goes without saying, hopefully. Obviously, the, the key point really is you need to follow some kind of structured, a logical approach to development of a cost risk model. Um, and you've got to get the, the structure of the model correct. You need to. Um, have a good understanding of the risk information that goes into there as well. Now, by risk, I mean the risk events that could affect the program and the uncertainty surrounding each individual line item in that cost risk model as well. And importantly, when it comes to defending your cost risk model as well, justification as well. Why have you included um, a worst case estimate for a particular cost element at 15 million pounds, say, why wasn't it 20 million pounds? You need to be able to provide evidence to justify every single entry in your cost risk model. Um, next series of slides are just a, uh, around common sort of bad practice. Bad practice is a bit too harsh, but things that are commonly carried out which don't aid good quality risk modeling. This is maybe something up here, too many risks, too many data fields. It's more commonly seen uh, when a project's up and running, but I have seen it when bid prices are being put together as well. Um, the problem with that really is too many risk line items you're therefore watering down the confidence that you have in every single estimate, particularly in an instance where you're putting a bid together and you've got limited time to put that bid together. So having massive risk registers are just basically unmanageable and don't really aid cost risk modeling. Another common problem is unfounded post-mitigation estimates. And here's a, a good example. So if you take that risk one, a probability of 50%, a cost of 200K, and there's obviously something that goes on, and that brings the probability of the risk occurring down to 25%, and the cost impact down to a 100K. And you'll get things like that, monitor progress. Well, that doesn't really tell you much, does it? And how can you hang 25% reduction in the probability of that risk occurring, um, and the cost consequence as well? Really, we should be looking for mitigation actions to have a, a named individual and a date by which that action is completed. So again, these are all things that if someone was to investigate the way in which you've calculated your risk budget, you, people would just rip a, a hole in this because how can you justify that based on monitor progress? Now, this is a very common approach to developing a risk budget on a, on a project. <coughs> and it's based on summing the weighted um, impact of the risks in your risk register. And um, I'll go into a few reasons why it's, it's not good. Basically, it's potentially irrational to consider that's the way in which the project will behave because it, it bears no um, information in there about your quality of estimates for each cost element. Um, it bears no information in that cost risk model of how, if risk one occurs, there is a corresponding impact on the likelihood of risk two occurring. You haven't captured in there a real life scenario, it's not, replicable, it's not representative as to how the project would behave. It's a very commonly used form. Now, unfortunately, a lot of instances where that is genuinely recognized as not a good form to carry out. 
The next step is to say, well, let's take an extra level of sophistication and we'll assign three-point estimates to each risk impact and we'll carry out a Monte Carlo simulation on the risk register. The key thing there, it's on the risk register. It's not really a full-blown cost risk model. And for the same reasons as articulated just now, um, assumes each risk is, is a di discrete event, um, often fails to take account of correlation between components, the likelihood of risk X having an influence on risk T should it occur. You see instances as well where um, very low probability of occurrence risks occur in bid risk registers and they may well have a, a massive impact and the question that should be asked, should this be a, a risk that's being managed and controlled by the project manager, by the project, or should the organisation be taking that and managing it separately? There's a certain instances as well of sort of entryism where sort of almost like a false picture can be presented uh, within a risk register um, where of another sort of series of bad examples here, I, I guess, you know, risks owned by the customers being included in the risk register. Um, risk estimates designed to keep the stakeholder happy. So it's a risk register that's sort of disingenuous. It's put together purely for the purpose of achieving the win. <coughs> and that doesn't help you down line because you haven't got your risk budget, the necessary risk budget in place. So what does good look like? Um, there's no single answer to that, but there's a number of things that need to be included. You need to include the whole cost from the whole scope of the project. The way in which the cost risk model is created has to replicate how the project will behave. You've got to try and avoid duplication, which can easily be incorporated if you've got uh, uncertainty around each cost line item and risks, events included in your cost risk model as well. You need to incorporate the effects of schedule performance. So in uh, addition or an input to the cost risk modeling process is a schedule risk analysis. So the marching army costs of schedule delay will need to be a line item in your cost risk model as well. Be able to simulate multiplicative effects. Now really that's around um, estimation. When we carry out estimates, estimates, we invariably are quite narrow when defining three-point estimates. Our ability to come up with worst case estimates can be quite weak. And this is where it's beneficial to <coughs> capture all the sources of uncertainty around a, <coughs> a particular cost element in your cost risk model in order to consider how those multiplicative effects can combine to de determine that worst case estimate. And again, in terms of building the body of evidence to be able to justify the development of this risk budget, all your assumptions need to be captured as well, and all the justification for individual estimates it is challenging to get right, and it takes time. And unfortunately, when writing a bid, invariably we don't give it enough time to get right. And it's not a single snapshot as well. It's the, it is an iterative process to get right. Um, often, and I've seen it in very large organisations where a single pass is carried out to determine the risk budget. And it was probably based on what they did last time, the last project they ran. Um, so my ap approach that I typically use is one that follows a, a multi press approach. Starting top down, we carry out what's referred to as a first pass <coughs> view of cost risk. And this is quite a crude approach. And really, it's focused on informing the second pass and the third pass. So it's quite a quick view of uh, gathering a, uh, a 
a view of the potential cost of a, a project or a, a program. And as, yeah, as I said, sports design and the risk model. And it adds up the various cost components within the project. And it basically adds up the worst case estimates and the best case estimates. So rather than uh, having to produce three-point estimates, it's based on producing two-point estimates for every cost element within the program. I've got an example that we'll take you through to sort of explain what I'm getting at there. And as I say, it can be used to do things like identify which carries greatest or least risk, because it might not be immediately obvious. Uh, and again, in terms of informing the model and capturing information in terms of how the project could behave, um, it can be used to capture instances where costs should correlate to one another. The next step, the second pass, um, is more detailed. Um, and as it says there, it's informed from your first pass. Um, at this point, you're starting to try and build more structure to your model um, in order to make sure that it is rational, that it reflects how the project is going to behave. It needs to include costs that can easily just be added together. For every single line item in that cost model, you need to include the estimation uncertainty 